So, hello and welcome to the 2021 Urban Tree Festival. Uh, my name is Greg Packman. I'm on the steering committee and one of the organisers of the Urban Tree Festival, uh, and I'll be the host for this evening. So the Urban Tree Festival is a celebration of all things urban trees, their, ben uh, their, their benefits and their beauty, their majesty and their magic. The festival seeks to connect trees to the people to their local urban trees connecting tree lovers and tree newcomers uh, alike, as well as connecting people to each other with the intent of sharing experiences and distributing tree knowledge far and wide. The festival runs until next Sunday, the 23rd of May. And we've got nine days of fantastic tree-related content and inspiring events, which you can find out on our website and event listings. The festival's run and organized by a group of committed volunteers and while we're supported by some amazing charities and organisations such as the Woodland Trust, the Greater London Authority and Trees for Cities, we are very dependent upon uh, donations. So to anybody who has donated, thank you very much. It's immensely appreciated. But if anybody would like to donate or we'll donate again, then it's always appreciated and it helps us produce new events and support other groups that we work with as well. So very, very excited tonight to bring you two uh, fantastic speakers for our event, The Wonder of Ancient Trees. Uh, we'll be talking about ancient trees and fungi. So our first speaker, Jill Butler. Jill worked for the Wooden Trust from 1995 to 2019, and 17 of those years were spent as a conservation advisor on ancient trees. Since leaving the Woodland Trust, Jill has continued to specialise in ancient and veteran trees and trees in forests, wood pastures and parkland. Jill is a trustee of the Tree Register and of the Ancient Tree Forum, as well as a keen recorder and verifier of the Ancient Tree Inventory. Our second speaker, Professor Lynn Boddy, is Professor of Fungal Ecology at Cardiff University. Lynn has taught and researched into the ecology of fungi associated with trees and wood decomposition for 40 years, and is currently studying the fascinating communities of fungi and other orga organisms that send the decay the centers of old trees. Lynn is a prolific author, having edited over six books and published over 250 uh, scientific papers, and is the chief editor of uh, the Journal of Fungal Ecology. And her most recent publication, released in March of this year, was the book Fungi and Trees, Their Complex Relations. And I have Okay, I'm being defeated by the Zoom background, but uh, this is this is my copy. But you'll see you'll see an image of the book uh, in this presentation, and I'll be putting a, a link to the putting a link to the book website uh, in as well. So just a couple of quick points on housekeeping. This is in the webinar format, so you're automatically muted and off screen. But please put any questions into the Q and A box at the bottom. Because if questions are put into the chat, it makes it much more difficult for me to find them and ask at the end. Um, but please do feel free to use the chat to talk to your fellow um, participants, but please select all panellists and attendees so everybody can see your message if you wish to. We are scheduled to finish at about 7pm and I'll try and get as many questions in as I can. But you know, if we get a lot of questions and we may go a minute or two over. Um, we're also recording this presentation and which will be available on our Urban Tree Festival YouTube page um, within a few days or a week of publication. So I'll pass over to Jill for our first presentation. Over to you, Jill. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be with you all tonight. Fantastic turnout. So thank you for coming along. Um, Many of you will recognize these fantastic sweet chestnuts um, and cast your mind back to the London Olympics when not only did Danny Boyle make an ancient tree the centerpiece of his introduction to the Olympics indoors, but the Olympic Committee chose nearly every single ancient tree site in London uh, for events. We were not quite so happy about Greenwich being used uh, for the equestrian events, but the trees in London have been showcased around the world relatively recently. So we know that there is some appreciation out there of these fantastic trees, ancient trees. So I was asked to talk a bit about ancient trees 
and um, to talk about why there's, uh, you know, why the UK is so special for them. I'm going to cover that a bit towards the end of my talk. Um, and I was also asked to focus a lot on London and talk about how important London is as an ancient tree capital. And I think it's one of the best ancient tree capitals of the world. Not that I've been to a lots of capitals, but I just know uh, that it will be one of the most fantastic capitals in the world. Uh, so first of all, though, we need to just recap. I know last year Greg gave a talk about ancient trees, but uh, let's just get our head a bit around them. So there, these trees are in what we call the ancient life stage, i.e. any tree that's beyond maturity. And often you can tell if a tree is ancient because it will have a large girth. If it's old beyond maturity, it's been putting on a lot of rings and so it's gonna be fat. Um, it's very, very often going to be hollowing as in this lovely old oak at Windsor. And it's going to have age related crown retrenchment or the crown is shrinking, it's growing downwards as uh, Ted Green would uh, call it. So these are ancient trees and I'm gonna take a, a uh, oh no, first of all, so let's think about that girth. Um, and what sort of girths are we thinking about for an ancient oak tree? Well, if you look at the second line here and look at the yellow, these are the trees, it, their ancient girth sizes. So they go up to 14 meters in girth. And if you think about that, the ancient life stage of the oak is longer than its young life stage and its mature life stage put together. The same applies in yews as well. These are some of the longest lived trees in the UK. Um, many of the others, even for example, holly will have a much longer, if they're allowed to live out their lives, and there is some debate that um, trees can live forever if they're allowed to layer and just carry on walking across the landscape or rolling across the landscape. Um, it, trees often will have a fantastically long ancient life stage. I've taken the, um, I've been a bit cheeky and taken this illustration from Lynn's book that she sent me for another talk. And just to re-emphasize, what we're talking about is we're really, these, this is the young life stage here, if you can see my cursor. Um, and then you get up to full maturity. And then from that moment on, you can start to see the crown, the age-related crown retrenchment coming in. All the time, the girth is getting fatter and fatter. But more to the point, you can see that the hollowing started possibly here. Um, and is increasing until you get to the very last stage of the tree. And that's more or less the image that we saw of the tree uh, at Windsor. So this is a, this ancient life stage is very long. long. Um, and all that time, wait, wait, wait a the trees are changing in habitat. And that provides some very, very important new niches. So Oliver Rackham said, one 500, one 500 year old oak cannot be replaced by 200, no, sorry, 10,000 200, 200 year old oaks because the habitat has completely changed. And with that habitat change, evolution has given us thousands of species that are specially adapted to the ancient life stage. And that's why it's really, well, the trees are important in their own right because they are rare, but more to the point, they also uh, have carry through like an arc, as Neb Fay has said, they carry through like an arc all these other species as they go through their ancient life stage. So they're really important, not just for themselves, although that's really important, but for other organisms as well. So let's just take a, a bit of a look at um, London and taken from the ancient tree uh, inventory. 
Uh, and if you do the analysis, um, it comes out as nearly six, 3,600 ancient vet other veteran and notable trees recorded across Greater London. And we can break that down a little bit more. But perhaps the longest lived of the trees in London is the Totteridge yew, which is an unbelievably special yew. You can see how fat that is. Yews, grow, yews can grow exceptionally slowly. Um, and a tree like this is possibly a thousand or, um, or, or more years in age. Unbelievable uh, uh, tree um, there in, in London. Now, UK has um, thousands of ancient and very, very old yews by comparison with most other countries in Europe. That's really intriguing that we have so many uh, yews. It's probable that it's because we are that much more isolated from the continent um, and that uh, Christianity that came and really overtook the uh, religious sites where yews were used very much uh, for uh, being a focal point for people to come and, and uh, celebrate. Um, they, it didn't have quite the same, um, over, uh, it didn't overrun the previous uh, religions in quite the same way. And we have obviously pagans today who very much uh, celebrate uh, the ancient you. So, but these are very much a, uh, these ancient yews are often, uh, very often associated with churchyards and religious sites. So that's one of the reasons why we have old trees is to do with social customs, in particular, uh, religious customs. Another amazing tree, although sadly now not alive, um, is the medieval oak, which stands at Hampton Court, um, in the grounds at Hampton Court. Massive, 12 meet, over 12 metres in girth when it was alive. Incredible tree. Sadly now just a, a remnant. But the location of that tree tells us that there has been a grazed parkland all around it uh, for the whole of its uh, the whole of its life, and I want to show you a bit about why that might be um, as we go through the talk. But in in this instance, this is a historic tree. It's not just um, a, a, an important living. Well, it, it's still alive, even though it's dead it, as it's decaying um, with through its associated organisms. But it's a historic thing. It's been there for probably a thousand years. And so it's a feature. It's as important as our old cathedrals, our old buildings in London. And it tells us about that particular place and how that place has been for uh, the millennia, probably. So, but it's not just about individual trees that we should get excited about London. And there are some incredible sites, of course, and many of you will know Richmond Park. Um, but I've used Richmond and this wonderful old pollard at Richmond as a backcloth to break down those figures for London a little bit more. So out of that 3,600 trees, 400, over 400 are actually what we would call ancient. Um, that is an incredible tally, uh, absolutely incredible, um, particularly to be in one of the most populous and leading cities of the world, an incredible, to have that number of veteran tr uh, ancient trees. A further 2,500 nearly are what we might call other veteran trees. They've got hollowing or decaying wood habitat, but they're not, uh, they're not ancient. They're in their mature life stage, but they haven't made it to the ancient life stage. And then we've got nearly a thousand large, girth, what we would call large girth trees, um, nine, uh, nearly, uh, which is over four meters 91. So 
I didn't choose these categories of nationally important trees. The Natural England did. They decided that ancient trees are nationally important, veteran trees are nationally important, and large girthed trees are nationally important. And they said the very, very highest sites of importance have 15 ancient trees, 100 veteran trees, and uh, um, 15 trees with a girth greater than 4.91 meters. So London is astonishingly important as an ancient tree, veteran tree site, if you just totted up the numbers of trees and uh, put them together um, as, a, as a whole, if, you, if we could do that as a whole in London. But more crucially too, there are 92 oaks with girth greater than six meters and Alios Fajon, and I'm going to come on to that a bit later on. So just remember that figure of 92 oaks with a girth greater than six meters, because I shall come back to that later on. Other incredible sites are places like the wonderful Bushy Park. And we can actually, through the ancient tree inventory, look back in time and see where the trees were. It, well, these, these trees today, how they featured back on the old maps. Now, the first Epoch OS maps were incredibly detailed and accurate. And it's very likely that the trees that we have recorded as veteran and ancient on this map are, uh, were there 150 or so years ago when this map was actually made. But what I particularly want to draw your attention to is all these individual dots here, which don't have representative markings of, of today. And all these dots over here and some more dots around here. Now I've been out and looked at that area and I think these are ancient hawthorns. And I think the remnants of those ancient hawthorns are largely still there. And I have been speaking to Royal Parks because I think it's so important that we record those hawthorns. And this is one of the factors that we haven't quite got our eye into. We are very good at recognizing and recording big fat sweet chestnuts, big fat yews and big fat oaks. But we're not so good at recognizing the ancient trees of these much smaller stature species. But in the case of Bushy, they used to have a, an, uh, a May Day celebration, um, which was associated with white, white flowers. Now they now do it with horse chestnut. But in actual fact, it's very, very likely that Hawthorn was the reason for that celebration in the past. And, and really, it would be marvellous if we could resurrect that. And Royal Parks have established some new Hawthorns there at Bushy, but um, we, you know, we need to try and keep nurturing every single living Hawthorn that's still there at Bushy, because I think it's, it's telling us stories. Every single species of ancient tree tells us a different story. And the Hawthorn is very much the story of uh, this grazed landscape um, and particularly the deer because the deer do love to hide up in the hawthorn and have their fawns in the hawthorn. So it's very much uh, associated with that particular management. Now I talked a bit about um, when you have an important site with uh, 15 or more ancient trees, 100 or more veteran trees, and lar 15 large diameter trees. And here you can see, this is 2013 um, data. So we're now 2021, so it's different now. It's better, let's put it that way, it's better. But even then in 2013, Richmond absolutely shouts out at you that it's one of these top, top sites. Red is the, the highest value. Orange is the next value. So here you've got bushy, but actually bushy should be showing bright red as well because of the hawthorns. You've got Kew and Cyan Park to the north. And then uh, the next uh, best quality are the yellows. They must have an ancient tree with them. Um, and then the greens are largely veterans, but we are data deficient still. 
as I'm emphasizing. So these could still change color. And as we're finding more and more sites, so we should be putting more and more blobs on the map for London. One of the sites that doesn't quite show on this map of London uh, is Epping, which is of course unbelievably important for people of London. And you can see it if you put in the Essex map. And this Essex map, you'll see when I show you some older maps than this, um, Essex is really, really important in terms of its um, ancient tree sites as well. And there's a good reason for that. But we've got Epping here, and we've got uh, Hainault here and various other, and then you've got Hatfield Forest up here. So we're starting to show these hotspots of really important trees and London has got so many. And in fact, I usually say, if you go out on the railways or you go out on the motorways out of London, you will go past or you will be able to see into sites with fantastic um, ancient and other veteran trees every which way that you go. And um, I think once we get the map better populated, you'll be able to see exactly what I mean. And we shouldn't forget some of the smaller smart sites. I don't know if anybody's been to Lesney Abbey Woods, but um, Peter, who's organizing, helping to organize this um, webinar, um, he's very keen on mulberries. And this is one of the fabulous mul mulberries from Lesney Abbey uh, Woods, which um, is well, well worth a visit and is astonishing tree. So, you know, we've got these unusual species and these small, these less well-known sites. I certainly didn't know about Lesney Abbey Woods until I was asked to go and visit. So a little bit of history. And why do we have these fantastic uh, trees? And why do we have um, these fantastic places? Well, for me, one of the major reasons is deer. Um, so we have had a love affair with deer since, well, tell me about it, 40,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago when we started painting their likeness in the caves of uh, Altamira um, and Lascaux. Uh, we, we have had a spiritual relationship. This isn't a hunting scene. This is a scene of um, wonder and, and um, wanting to capture their magnificence. Um, we also have at uh, Cresswell Crags in Nottinghamshire, in the caves there, we also have cave paintings of native deer there. So it's not just a Southern European thing. This is deep, deep heritage. We mustn't just think about these animals as grazing machines. We have a very, very deep heritage with these deer. They also are part of our native ecology as well. And the two have gone hand in hand in making the UK one of the most special old growth landscapes in the world. And we tend to overlook deer, I'm afraid, or rather um, treat them badly when actually they have played such an enormous part. And how are the mighty fallen? These used to be the status symbol to give us presence both dead and alive by the kings of England. How have we forgotten this? And um, why don't we <laughs> understand this a bit more? Anyway, native deer, they are incredibly historic, right back thousands of years, and they have been playing an important part for all that time. So this is a very old map, and it's, uh, it's from Della Hook's um, book, and it's a map from uh, rep representing Anglo-Saxon England and the elite, I mean, the kings, the high status people of the Anglo-Saxon um, society. They had already earmarked many, many sites that we have today as important for ancient trees and uh, grazing this wood pasture, this old growth habitat. They had already carved them out and taken them for themselves pre the Norman. So you've got here, Sherwood. You've got here, Witchwood. You've got the Weald of Kent and Sussex. 
you've got here the new forest and the forest of beer, Selwood, the forest of Dean. So forest of Arden, which Shakespeare romanticized and, and, and made famous. These were hunting forests. They were not really closed canopy. The deer love to meet at deer lawns and graze, they're grazing. So they have to have something to graze. They, you know, if you go to Windsor, the deer are in the parkland. The parkland is, these were much more park-like than they were closed canopy. And, and this is what I will also demonstrate, really important to understand this park-like landscape, which chimes, which resonates with Franz Vera's theory of the park-like prehistoric landscape. They, we have the evidence to prove that Franz Vera's theory is correct. So, but we can't forget about this guy, William. It's his millennium century and he did so much. He was the first to bring conservation legislation to, uh, to the UK. He brought forest law and through forest law, he protected some of our very best sites so that we have them today. There should be a society for the protection of conservation legislation. And he created, he was a hunter, he loved hunting the deer, as did Queen Elizabeth I, and that he, as a conquering king, he said, that's mine, I want that, and put his incredibly strong stamp on these amazing landscapes. And uh, we are benefiting from that today. But notice the pollard might have created, provided timber to go into his castle, which was created a thousand years ago. So watch out for 2066. And would he be proud to come back and enjoy, see any of his landscapes today that he created then? Would he be proud of that? Can we have nature recovery areas that recognize William's landscape um, and uh, do something to restore and protect and buffer and extend because to me these are the priority landscapes of the once of the elite and now so sadly been offset by uh, other things but anyway but the other quick thing to say was that if you look at the Bayer tapestry it's full of pollards and that is another story. He created the boats out of pollards and came across the channel in boats made out of pollards. And you can see that over here. These guys are swinging axes up in the crown. And, and um, so they're not cutting them down to make the boats. They're actually pollarding and making the planks somehow. Anyway, it's very interesting to look at the Bayer tapestry, which I think because of the uh, the trees, I think there's been a lot of debate about whether the Bayer tapestry was made in the UK, in England, in Canterbury or in Normandy. I think the trees prove that it was done in Normandy. But who am I <laughs> to, to start throwing these wild statements around? Anyway, every tree tells a story. And of course, we all know about the hornbeams that sites that ring around London because the bakers of London prized the very dense wood in faggots. You're not talking about large diameter wood, you're talking about twigs rammed together, thrown into the ovens, flash a flash of heat. Uh, you want it to combust as much as possible so you don't have a lot of ash. All the heat goes into heating the oven and you put the thing that needs the greatest heat in first like bread, and then you start uh, working your way down the list of other things that are right down to the egg custard that comes last. And then you fire it up again. So, and the bakers of London thought that hornbeam wood was the most important. Hence, we have Hainault Forest, uh, we have Epping Forest, and we have some of the great coppices as well. But with, of course, with pollards, you can have your grazing as well as your wood production. It's, as Ted would say, two tier. You're maximizing, it's not just what can grow out of the ground, it's what you're, you're actually 3D benefit from, from the process. And of course, fantastic epping, and it's absolutely astonishing beech trees, um, unbelievable sight, um, incredible. 
so much to say about it, but these are some of the fantastic sites, but these are pollards again. And that is another point to make. Why do we have so many old trees? Well, it's to do with the, I'm going to come on to the deer parks, but pollarding was a major part as well of the story. But I talked about William and the Norman forests. If this isn't a definition for wilding, I don't know what is. But anyway, that's a statement from 50, the nearly 1600. And I think, uh, you know, here we are trying to come up with definitions of wilding. Um, and here it is, it was already invented 400 and or so years ago. Anyway, um, at the height of the Norman forests, uh, these all these gray areas were, were forests. So es forest of Essex with some smaller forests in here, forest of Surrey, uh, coming down to Windsor around here. Um, that's Selwood there. Here's the new forest and here's the forest of beer. So, you know, unbelievable. And, um, uh, you know, King John, my hero, but I haven't got enough time to talk about him. Uh, and if we home in on this and look at, say, North London, you can see by 11, the 1100s, you know, all of these areas uh, were under, you know, uh, forest law. So some of them, were more con more wild than others. Uh, uh, so, you know, in some cases, it just meant a line on a map. In other cases, quite clearly, it meant uh, a lot more than that and, and was managed by, managed by the king. Anyway, you can recognize some wonderful uh, names of forests like Hatfield Forest in these names. So great history again really incredible history. Thousand years of naming forests has come through to today. Out of these forests, as they shrank, um, you get the formation of deer parks because you needed the permission of the king to form a deer park. And then out of that, Capability Brown and people like Repton created the new landscape, which uh, the English landscape, which again has gone around the world, this um, rather beautiful landscape. And again, Repton, man of science, and it's just, but it's not just of science, of taste will recognize the beauties in a tree which others would condemn for its decay. Now, I see that I'm running on and I haven't quite got there. So I'm just going to um, uh, just say, why are these trees so important? Um, because they also, as they age, they have these wonderful other species that are associated with them, either the bark through the lichens, the hollowing or the decay fungi, um, and the mycorrhizal fungi. But one last slide is that in 86, Francis Rose and uh, Paul Harding, they wrote pasture woodlands in lowland Britain. Richmond, Epping, all of those sites are in this book as important sites. And they concluded that these pasture woodlands are closer to wildwood than high forest. And they're the only structure where the primeval forest, the old growth system survives. We cannot get that in plantation woodland or, and because of the history of ancient, ancient other ancient woodlands, it's not the same. And um, they are really important places, very rich for lichens, invertebrates, fungi, all associated with the long lifespans of the trees. And it is my contention that this old growth is almost unique in an international context and uh, really, really important. And I know that there's many others that believe it's our major responsibility to understand it better, conserve it and sustain it. Great, well, thank you very much and um, hope there's loads of questions uh, to follow on from that. So um, I'll be handing over to Lynn. Thank you very much, Jill. It's uh, fascinating. Um, that Repton quote is Repton quote is special. I found it. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of my favourites. What a quote! It's uh, I hadn't yeah. seen it before. It's fantastic. Oh, quote. Right. Oh, right. Um, it's but, that science and but uh, aesthetic, aesthetic and heritage. heritage sorry, is, sorry, Lynn. That's good. Heritage is key, and very. It's nowadays it's very much pigeonholed into one or the other. Um, 
before I move to Lynn, Jill mentioned the Ancient Tree Inventory, which is a really, really important resource that we need to build. It just so happens on Tuesday at midday, we have a workshop with Tom Reed from the Woodland Trust showing us how to identify ancient and veteran trees and how to add it onto the inventory. And just posting a link into the chat now so you can see it. So thanks to the wonders of modern technology, um, in Wales as well, in this, there have been a couple of internet and power issues. So what we're doing is we have a, uh, Lynn very kindly sent in a pre-recorded video, which we're going to show now, um, just as a fail safe in case there are any power issues. So I'm going to share my screen onto the video. So um, I'll play this video and then um, we'll go over to questions. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to tell you about the complex relationship between fungi and trees. Whenever we think of fungi, I guess one of the first things that we think of is mushrooms and toadstools. These are the fruit bodies of the fungi. They're equivalent to the flowers and fruits of flowering plants. But of course, we know that plants have more than the flowers and fruits. They have the leaves and the roots and the shoots. And fungi have an equivalent too, which is hidden in whatever it is they're growing on. We know that plants produce seeds to spread, while well, the fungal equivalent is spores. And you can see the clouds of spores drifting about on the air underneath this fruit body. Usually, they drop within a few metres of the fruit body but sometimes they can spread a very long way, perhaps even over oceans. Spores are small, usually just a few hundredths of a millimetre. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes with different ornamentations. When a spore lands, if the conditions are right, if it's warm enough and wet enough and there's food available, they will germinate. A small tube forms from the end of a spore. This is called a hypha. More than one hypha is called, are called hyphae. So hyphae, the plural of hypha. A hypha branches and grows more. They branch in a higgledy-piggledy to start with and then form a much more evenly branched network, as you can see here. Hyphae grow from the tips. Now, this is a little bit juddery because it's playing over Zoom. They move away, they spread away from each other as they grow outwards. But side branches come up and fill those gaps. They're microscopic, but sometimes you get lots of them actually growing together rather than growing away from each other. They grow towards each other and they form rather larger organs. And then we can see them with the naked eye, such as this mycelium, which we see here. They form the most wonderful patterns. This is the living part of the fungus, the main part of the fungus, the business part of the fungus. We can see signs of fungi when we're out and about. Obviously, you can see this ring, this fairy ring of the shaggy parasol. But within the central part, there is the mycelium of the fungus hidden beneath the ground. Here we can see another fairy ring fungus, Clytocybe nebularis, and the mycelium associated with those fruit bodies has been revealed. The mycelium is the main part of the fungus. As I've said, the fruit bodies are just the reproductive parts. We also see signs of fungi uh, as rings, uh, but without the fruit bodies, or perhaps there are a few fruit bodies here, but you can see this, this dead patch of grass. In this particular case, the fungal mycelium is harming the grass roots. Hence, you get this dead region. There's a fungus mycelium there hidden from our site. Now, whereas fungi tend, their mycelia tend to grow out fairly symmetrically, their colonies or their, their body forms or the territory they occupy is not always symmetrical. You can see this here in this fallen tree trunk. Each of these regions is occupied by a single individual fungus. There's one in there, one there, one there, another there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's probably a hundred or more uh, individual fungi within this 
within this fallen trunk. Fungi have put down barriers surrounding their territory, a bit like how we have hedges or walls around our homes and gardens or walls around our medieval cities. And these fungi fight to keep their territory. We can see these battles. Here is a fungal battle occurring on soil. This is a tray of soil in the laboratory. And we put a block of wood there, a block of wood there. This one was occupied by the sulfata fungus, this by the fungus called Phanerichite velutina. Mycelium grew out and met just about here. When they met, they started a fight. And this one is clearly getting the upper hand. It's producing enzymes and probably volatile and diffusible chemicals, which are killing the mycelium of the sulfur tough fungus. And if we came back in a couple of weeks time, we would see that the sulfur tough fungus has been completely replaced by Phanerichite velutina. Now, all these battles are going on all of the time. Who would have thought it when you walk around that the battles are happening below our feet, above our heads and everywhere? Now, these battles are a bit like a sports league. So some fungi are better fighters than others. So if you imagine this is a sports league, here are the two we've seen fighting already, Fanrakiti, Velutina and Hyphaloma. They're actually both very good fighters. And those teams, or in this case, fungi that are at the top of the league, tend to beat most of those other teams lower down. These ones at the bottom of the league um, don't do particularly well in battles at all. But of course, just as in sports leagues, like the Football League or the FA Cup, sometimes you get um, a giant killer that sort of comes from nowhere. And actually, who is victor often depends upon the environment, how much food there is, what the temperature is, is there enough water, how much water is there, what's the gaseous regime, are there other organisms about interfering with them, such as invertebrates feeding on their mycelia. And just as one example, you can see that temperature affects these outcomes sometimes. Again, we have the sulfur tough fungus here, Hyphaloma fasciculari, and uh, a colonizer of oak branches here, Flebia radiator. You can see that Flebia is doing very well on this plate of agar jelly at 20 degrees C. But look what happens at 25. Hyphaloma fasciculari is doing very much better. In fact, it has completely replaced the Flebia radiator. This mycelium you see here comes from the hyphaloma, the sulfur tuft fungus. So how do fungi food feed? Well, you know that we feed, we take in food through our mouths, it goes into our gut and enzymes digest it there. They break it down into from big molecules into small ones, which can soak up into our blood uh, stream and supplied around our body uh, for energy and for building blocks of new tissues. So we feed by internal ingestion, digestion, but fungi feed by external digestion. The individual hyphae secrete enzymes which break down big molecules into small molecules and then these nutrients, these small molecules are absorbed into the hyphae for further growth. Of course that does have a bit of a disadvantage because it means that a fungus might break down some food which could then, those small molecules could be stolen by other organisms, other microbes. So what do they feed on? Well, if we take kingdom fungi as a whole, they can feed on all of the naturally produced organic compounds that there are. But of course, taken individually, they have, they have, they have uh, different abilities, different preferences, and indeed they feed in different sorts of ways. So there are the rotters. Here are some examples of rotters on wood. They break down and feed off of dead material. Then there are the killers. So there are some things which can kill invertebrates, such as this beetle here. There's the fungus there, fruiting. And of course, you're well familiar, I'm sure, with um, ash dieback, which is a fungal disease, which is killing ash trees. Some fungi also feed on living tissues. They keep those living tissues alive, but they feed on living tissues. And straight away, I'm sure you think, oh, they must be harmful. And indeed, some of them are, such as these leaf parasites that you see here. They are removing, abstracting nutrients from the leaf. And of course, that's making the plant weaker in some way or another. They keep feeding like this. But 
there are others, and there are very, very many others that are beneficial to other organisms. These are mutualists. And there are two examples. There are lichens and mycorrhizas. In fact, these are the two examples which I'll tell you about with regard to photosynthetic organisms. So lichens, you may not realize it, but they are fungi. But embedded within the network of fungal hyphae that form the main body of the lichen, there are photosynthetic cells. There are cells of green algae or cyanobacteria. And together they work as a whole new organism. Those photosynthetic organisms make sugars which are fed to the fungus and the fungus uh, provides the water and the mineral nutrients. And then there are mycorrhizas, a hugely important relationship about which I'll tell you more in a moment. But let's return to rotters. Now people often say to me, oh, why do you bother with fungi? They're a nuisance, aren't they? They rot our food, our clothes, our homes. They kill our crops. And yes, some of them do do this. One might, I suppose, think of this as collateral damage. Without them, we would not be here. Every year, land plants make vast quantities of new plant material. And a similar amount of plant material dies. And a similar that amount of plant, dead plant material is broken down largely by fungi. This is crucial because aside from the inconvenience of the fact we'd be up to our armpits in dead stuff if it wasn't broken down, locked up in that dead material would be lots and lots of nutrients. They would no longer be available to plants. So by breaking down those dead tissues, the rotters release nutrients which allow plants to carry on growing. They are the great recyclers, the garbage disposal agents of the natural world. And here are a few examples. This wood rotted by fungi, um, the type of rot is called white rot. The fungus can break down all of the components of the wood, the, the, the cellulose, the hemicellulose, is the lignins, and it leaves it this white color. And in fact, eventually all of that wood will be broken down into carbon dioxide and water and the nutrients released. Here we can see wood again, rotting wood, but this time it's a brown color. It's brown rotted wood, the fungus has not broken down the lignin, and that's what leaves it the brown colour. All sorts of other things are rotten down, rotted away, everything you can think of. This is dung, this is the, the nail fungus, because it looks a bit like a carpenter's nail, Peronia punctata on dung. Actually, this is quite a rare fungus nowadays. And fungi can break down horn. And in fact, as I said, you name it, fungi can break it down if it's a natural organic product. Now we often see wonderful ancient trees that look something like this. Their centers have been hollowed out by fungal activity. And sometimes people say, oh, that poor tree, look what those fungi have done to it. But there's nothing poor about it. These are wonderful trees and they depend upon fungi. Those central tissues in the wood, in the trunk, they were dead. The fungus is breaking down dead material. It, it, it's not harming the tree. And there are lots of reasons why this heart rot of trees caused by fungi is important. Nutrient cycling is one of them. This is the centre of an old ancient uh, beech tree. And look at the rotted material inside. It looks more like soil. In fact, you can see lots of roots. These are roots produced by this tree actually coming down inside the trunk. And they are feeding on that dead material which the fungus has broken down. Trees are also important, the centers of trees for um, rare fungi, such as um, the rare oak polypore and the hericiums. It's also hugely important habitat for vertebrates. Worldwide, there are a thousand or more species of birds and mammals which are dependent upon hollows for habitat. And likewise, invertebrates too. In the UK alone, 1700 species depend on this type of habitat. And that includes 15% of the rarest species, such as the violet click beetle. Rot holes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and in all sorts of positions on the trunks of trees. And as I've already said, they're habitat for lots of invertebrates. 
such as pseudoscorpions and beetles and mites and larvae and spiders and snails. So fungi is decomposes. That's the one, one of the reasons why fungi are crucial to our planet. The second reason is the partnership that they form with plants. Now these fungi here, the fly agarics, Ammonita muscaria, they're one example of the important partnership between fungi and the roots of plants. The partnership is called mycorrhiza. The myco bit means fungus. The rhiza bit means root. So literally fungus root. Now here we can see the roots of um, some plants, some trees. There's a root, woody root. There's another one. One's there too. Now those aren't the absorptive roots. You can see that they're a brown color. Um, it's only the fine roots of trees and other plants which soak up water and nutrients. Now, these are the absorptive roots of plants that you can see here, but in fact, these are mycorrhizas, and little dumpy roots is an enlarged, uh, one of these mycorrhizal root tips. It's covered in almost a sock of hyphae. These hyphae extend into the root and they extend into the soil. You can see lots of hyphae, mycelium here. In fact, you can see there is masses of mycelium. None of the plant root is actually in contact with the soil. It is the fungal mycelium, which is soaking up water and mineral nutrients, feeds these to the plants and the plant pays the fungus with sugars. It is a mutualistic relationship. Um, and this, this picture here really brings this out to the full. Masses and masses of mycelium in the soil. Very, very fine. We can see it here because there's a lot in this little microcosm, but they're very fine hyphae. In fact, often approaching 600 metres of hyphae in every gram of soil. Now, mycorrhizal fungi form networks in soil. And this network or these networks are sometimes called the wood wide web. Each tree often has several or many species of fungi or indeed different individuals of the same species of fungi that form mycorrhizas with its roots. Different fungi are represented here by different colors. Sometimes the same individual fungus can form mycorrhizas with neighboring trees. So for example, this one indicated by yellow is partnered with this tree and this tree. And so sugars and mineral nutrients can be shared between trees and even chemical messages can pass along these mycorrhizal corridors from one tree to another. So a tree is never just a tree. A tree is always a tree plus very many fungi. Without fungi, we would not have our wonderful tree-filled landscapes. Without fungi, the ecosystems of our planet would not work. And without fungi, we would not be here. So if what I've told you has interested you, I, I have written um, a book which has been published recently. It is available online only from the Arbor Cultural Association. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I hope you will enjoy fungi and trees forever. Thank you uh, so much for that, Lynn. Um, I think I can speak for everyone when I say that it never stops being so fascinating, such a fascinating subject. Um, right, we've got we're four minutes to seven, so I'm assuming that people who want to stay will stay because we've got quite a few questions. So I will just jump straight into the questions. Um, one that I saw that was particularly, I thought was particularly interesting was from Caroline Moyer. Um, I'll start with Jill. What can we do to support old pasture woodlands and the fungi that surely can that they surely contain? Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think the thing is that we need to really, first of all, recognise how important they are. And whereas you know many of our habitats are incredibly important in a UK context, um, 
we do have to recognize that this particular habitat is incredibly rare elsewhere in Europe. And in terms of the tree species, that means that you know, we are the host of some of the most important old tree landscapes in Europe. And this doesn't, this isn't being recognized in terms of funding mechanisms. It's not being recognized in terms of people championing this, this landscape, these habitats, um, and saying, wow, these are fantastic. Um, we need to really uh, celebrate them, uh, enjoy them, but also make sure we are doing what uh, the conservation world should be doing, which is buffering and extending them. They, they, they are getting lots of pressure. I mean, uh, lots of people are using these um, important sites, you know, Bushy, uh, Epping, um, Hyde Park, incredible numbers of people are now have been using these sites in lockdown, appreciating how important they are, but that does also bring pressures too to those sites. And uh, so we need to really make sure that we are looking after the land as well as we can, but providing more opportunities for people to go and appreciate them in other places, but protecting as much as we possibly can. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, Lynn, hello, Lynn. Um, was there anything you could add to that about protecting the fungi in those sort of environments as well? Yeah, sure. So obviously it's important to protect the mycorrhizal fungi. And I suppose two things immediately spring to mind. One is that people very often don't realise how far the roots of trees spread and how far beyond that the mycorrhizal fungi, the mycelium is. I mean, people often think, oh, that the roots only go to, I don't know, as far out as the canopy does. And that's certainly not true. Roots extend far, far beyond that and the mycorrhizal fungi beyond that still. So we need to be very careful with what we're doing as far as um, the land around tree is concerned. So if it's in the agricultural setting, you don't plough right up to the tree because you've done phenomenal amounts of damage. And of course, compaction of soil is another important thing. And then another thing which we're very bad at is human is pollution. And uh, as far as mycorrhizal fungi are concerned, one of the main issues is nitrogen pollution. Um, so nitrogen pollution can be from various sources, um, such as um, just pollutants landing from the sky because of burning of fossil fuels and how uh, many other ways that we, we make nitrogen pollutants. And I, I, I guess so uh, other things like um, pro probably dog excrement in in, in um, highly walked areas. And the problem with nitrogen pollution is that um, trees lose their mycorrhizal fungi in high nitrogen pollution areas, the mycorrhizal fungi which extend out most uh, uh, in, in greatest distance with their, uh, with, their, with their hyphae and mycelium. Now some fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, do better. That's those that don't spread very far, probably because they cost less um, for the tree. But if a tree doesn't have its mycorrhizal fungi, which, which are searching a long way, it's only, and, and it probably doesn't need them from a nitrogen perspective, but it needs them from other perspectives because it's not only nitrogen that these fungi take up, it's water and other mineral nutrients. And they also offer protection um, to the root systems of trees by uh, physically by a little sock over those root tips, but also by the mass of mycelium that is there, and also by producing antagonistic chemicals against um, other organisms such as um, possible root pathogens. So uh, I think those are at least two areas which we really need also to think about. We need to think about the hidden part of the tree, the hidden part of the tree fungal association. Okay, great, that was a fascinating answer. Um, I'll stick with you just this next question. It came from Jules. The question was, what is the geisha regime? But I think it may have been to do with uh, gas exchange or the gas exchange in the fungus wars slides earlier on? Oh, yes, I'm sorry I didn't say that that clearly enough. So um, yeah, so uh, uh, surrounding us, we, we've got we've got air around us which contains nitrogen, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And of course you have that within wood as well, but you have different amounts. Um, so for example, in the, in um, 
the, the center of, of decaying wood, there's probably a, a lot of carbon dioxide and not very much oxygen. So I would have been better to have, to, have, to have mentioned oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide can affect the outcome of the battles between fungi. Thank you. Um, this is to both of you. Um, this question requires an hour long answer in full detail, but it's from Mike Talbot. Can you speak a bit more about the hollowing of ancient trees? Is it always fungi that hollow them and how do they stay, stay strong without their middles? So, um, right, Jill can do the strength part about how they can stay strong without their middles, if, you, if you're happy to. Um, you're, you're right, it, it is a, it's a more than an hour long answer for that. Um, you'll have to invite me back next year to talk about hollowing uh, of um, ancient trees, I guess. Uh, it's largely a fungal process because, of course, really it is only fungi which can break down um, the lignin, the lignin part of, of wood. Uh, there are a few other microbes that can, but they don't do it in, in um, very rapid time. But in saying that, it, it, it isn't just the fungi that are important because, of course, there are very, very many organisms present. Fungi are interacting all the time with other fungi, but also with invertebrates. And of course, we know that invertebrates are important ecosystem engineers as well. So in other parts of the world, for example, termites would have a, a big effect. Um, in, in Britain, ants can often have a big effect. But, but uh, invertebrates ha have a major effect on, on, on what's going on in the middle of trees because they eat fungi. And you think, oh, well, that, that probably gets rid of the fungi. But it, it, it does all sorts of very, very complicated things. So it's fungi and lots of other associated organisms which bring about the rotting of those trees, uh, about the hollowing of trees. Um, and it's a partic particularly a vast combination of different things at later stages, at earlier stages, it's predominantly um, just the fungi involved in, in, in many cases, though not all. Okay, so um, it, when a tree is growing, it's uh, putting on a new living ring on the outside. And um, there are different types of um, living wood, but generally speaking, um, a, quite a lot of the living rings are only about sort of 20, 30, 40 living rings on the outside of the trunk of the tree. And as Lynn has been saying, over time, the uh, center of that hollows away through decay. But the sapwood, as we call that living wood, is immensely strong. Now, I think we've got it upside down because when we want timber for building, we want the heartwood, but it's dried heartwood. Now, if you try to dry the sapwood, it wouldn't be as strong. It would probably rot away because there's so much moisture in the sapwood. It would probably decay before you could actually get heartwood. And also there are there are compounds which uh, help to prevent the decay process in the heartwood. So we've always thought of heartwood as being the strength in the tree. And in actual fact, I think it's the sapwood that is the strength in the tree and it's flexible too. It's more flexible. That living wood's more flexible. And because it's living, a tree has the capacity to put down more wood in places where it needs it to offset a prevailing wind or a lean or something like that. So it's the living wood that's really, really important. The other thing is, as the footprint of the tree grows, beyond maturity, the tree uh, is at a finite height, but beyond, it, it can only grow up to maturity and beyond that, it might actually grow downwards, as I was saying. But all the time, the trunk is getting bigger and bigger. And the more, the bigger the trunk, the more stable the tree becomes. It's a mathematical equation. I have to, um, I haven't got it off the tip of my tongue, but you know, it's, it's, it's just that um, the, the leverage um, is completely different for an ancient tree to a younger tree. So um, in two ways, the ancient tree is very much more stable than a younger tree. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, looking at the questions, every single one requires an hour-long webinar, <laughs> at least to answer. But um, I think I'll go back to you, Jill, from Carol. How do you differentiate between ancient, mature and veteran trees? All right. Well, 
uh, we talk about trees being in three major life stages. So the young tree from seedling uh, grows up um, and uh, starts to fill the whole uh, genetic, uh, 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 provides a tree with a, a based on its genetic database, which is characteristic. Um, and at maturity, it's grown to its maximum height and has put out its, its crown. By the way, um, we should always be valuing open grown trees because they're really important trees. I think they're more beautiful than a plantation tree and also very, very important for biodiversity in their own right. Um, but then you get to maturity uh, and then beyond maturity, the tree is going into its ancient life stage. So three main life stages, young, mature and ancient. So an ancient tree can only be old by comparison with other trees of the same species. Um, now, a mature tree is in that middle band um, and then a young tree is lower, but in that mature stage, it can, it can either through environmental conditions or as I showed with the diagram, it may already, because it's lost its tap root and air has, uh, has got in through the root system, um, it can start to hollow from the base upwards. And that we call these veteran characteristics. So veteran characteristics are hollowing, cavity creation, lots of large dead wood in the crown created through damage or lightning strikes or something like that. So a mature tree, can have these veteran characteristics. And if they are substantial enough, I mean, we're not talking about little dead twigs, if they're substantial enough, we will call that a veteran tree. Now, those characteristics are in ancient trees usually. So we usually say an ancient, all ancient trees are veteran. It's not absolutely true, but in the majority of cases, all ancient trees are veteran trees. But in that younger life stage, differentiating a tree that hasn't got any of those characteristics, which are mature or notable trees, compared with a mature tree that's got those veteran characteristics we call a veteran tree for shorthand. Did I answer that? Yeah. Great, did I answer that question? Yeah, that's very, Great. It's a very complex answer in general, but it's a very good answer. Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a, I think it's really simple, but maybe that's, <laughs> because I'm so used to it, really. Yeah, I think yeah. it, it, there's a little bit of getting your head around it, um, but once that's it, and most trees are absolutely straightforward to tell. You'll just, the majority of trees, there are exceptions. So that makes us all sort of stop and think. Yeah, um, I have put a link to the Ancient Tree Forum website in the chat. There are some absolutely amazing resources on the Ancient Tree Forum website. I recommend it. And I've also put another link to Tuesday's event. Um, Okay, I'll start with Lynn for this one from uh, Hardia, and it's how are roots impacted with ancient trees? And I'm guessing there's a knock-on effect on the fungi and mycorrhizal association. Sorry, what do you mean, how are they impacted? Okay, well, well so, so the question itself is just how are the roots impacted with ancient trees? I, I think it might be, you know, the ability of the trees to uptake nutrients and you know, effects of soil compaction in the rooting environment as the tree ages and of course the fungal associations um, related to that. So you're talking about compaction, I guess, mostly. So compaction um, has the effect of um, altering the, um, the soil structure effectively because uh, it's, it's being squashed. Um, so the, there, there are less voids, um, gaps in the soil for, for air. It's harder uh, for water to get in. Who knows, maybe even mycorrhizal fungi will be damaged. So whatever you think might be happening to the roots, that probably also is, is uh, uh, happening um, to the mycelium as well. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's a major problem compaction as, as, we, as we know. Um, trees have to get hold of their water and hold of their, uh, hold of their nutrients. And it's, as I say, largely the fungi that do that. So anything that's stopping a fungus doing that um, is, is a problem. Jill, you might want to know more about various bits and bobs and to that. 
Yeah, um, so um, lots of things to say about roots. Um, but one of the key things is just think about those uh, thousand year old trees that I showed uh, a couple of pictures of. Just think about it. That tree has not moved in its life. It can't go to the supermarket for food. It's stuck in that position and it, all the nutrients that it needs needs to come to it. And um, that is just a, a fascinating process. And that's part of the system that the sunlight um, and the leaves that rain down and the twigs that rain down and all the material that comes out of the canopy of the tree have to are really important to feed that tree for such a long period of time. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it's it, you know, because it can't just decide, oh, I've run out of food here. I'll just toddle over there because it looks better over there. And it's just amazing how sustainable trees are. But bear in mind, as Lynn has mentioned, that tree roots extend out an incredible distance. And just for basics, it's further than this, but for basics, it's uh, one and a half to two and a half times the radius of the crown. And most of those roots are in the top uh, six inches, 15 centimeters. So as Lynn's saying, that is a bit of a vulnerable zone. They need the majority need to be in that area because of oxygen, et cetera. But again, if, as Lynn's saying, if you squeeze out the oxygen, that's going to have a really dramatic impact on the tree. And of course, carrying on from that, I mean, Jill's absolutely right about the, the, the self-sustaining cycling um, part. So um, the rotting of the centres of old trees, as I've already said, is a, a way of releasing nutrients. But, but leaves and twigs and anything fall in those nutrients, if those, the nutrients locked up in that material will be released to those trees by decomposer fungi if those leaves and twigs are left there. If they're cleaned up and taken away, then nutrients are effectively being stolen. And um, as Jill's pointed out, this is a major problem for trees because they, they, they can't get up and walk. So, you know, us being tidy and clearing up is, is, is a nightmare. Well, I, th I think we have been guilty of, sorry, Lynn, I think we've been guilty of starving our trees. And I think that's really, really serious. And now, of course, Q, um, although they like to be a bit tidy in key places, they blow the leaves now back under the tree so that um, those leaves are not lost to the tree because it's so, so important. But bear in mind, don't try suddenly to go the, uh, to the other extreme and think, oh, I better give this tree a lot of nitrogen because I've already told you about problems with the... Uh, natural, natural. Okay, yeah, fantastic answers there. Um, I have my own answer very quickly. Um, a lot of my work is in urban parks with trees in London. And firstly, getting people who don't work with trees to appreciate the impact of soil compaction is such a challenge. And um, trying to change a 100-year-old plus mindset of neat mowing grass and tidiness is a real challenge as well and our trees and our parks are really really suffering um i think because of the time and the questions that we've got some really good questions but in order to answer them we're going to be here till 10 o'clock um i just want to say an absolute huge thanks to lynn and jill um an absolutely brilliant presentations i'm sure well based on the comments coming through in the chat everyone else has really really enjoyed it as well so yeah, thank you so much, well, the, the both of you, for two amazing presentations and great answers. Uh, thank you to the audience as well for coming along, spending your Sunday evening with us. Um, and please have a look at the rest of the festival lineup on, as I mentioned, Tuesday, the Ancient Tree Inventory. Friday this week at one o'clock, we have our Tree Rings webinar featuring David Humphreys from Hampstead Heath. He's the tree manager there, talking about ancient and veteran trees on Hampstead Heath, uh, as well as Peter Coles also. Uh, on this webinar, we're talking about ancient mulberries of London. So that's 1 p.m. on Friday. Um, yeah, again, just a huge thank you to anyone for everyone for attending. And if you can donate to the festival, it is immensely appreciated as well. Um, right, so I'm going to have to end the webinar there. But again, huge thank yous, and a recording will be um, available soon. So yeah, thank you, Lynn and Jill and Peter. Goodbye. <laughs>